You're listening to the B&H Photography Podcast. For over 40 years, B&H has been the professional source for photography, video, audio, and more. For your favorite gear, news, and reviews, visit us at bnh.com or download the B&H app to your iPhone or Android device. Now here's your host, Alan Weitz. Greetings and welcome to the B&H Photography Podcast. Today we are going to continue our discussions with photographers that we recorded up at the Eddie Adams Workshop this fall. We're going to have a conversation with photographer Steve Winter, a 25-year veteran of National Geographic. Steve's been taking pictures since the age of seven. He started off as a photojournalist with Black Star and has evolved into a wildlife photographer with a specialty in big cats. If you're familiar with the story of P-22, a cougar that wanders around the hills of Los Angeles, you're already familiar with Steve's work. And we're going to talk about the cats and a lot of other interesting topics today with Steve. We are with Steve Winter, a uh, wildlife photographer for National Geo and a lot of other outlets. Uh, and he photographs people as well. And we're going to talk about that a little bit later on. But first, we're going to talk about a lot, a, one of the things he's most known for is photographing cats in particular. And uh, your, a lot of your stuff is with remote uh, triggering devices. Uh, and, uh, could you tell us a little bit about that? This, this stuff is striking that you're doing. Well, um, I first got involved in it uh, doing the first Jaguar story for National Geographic. Uh, but I wasn't successful because it's a very secretive animal. Uh-huh. And I got a couple images of it. Uh, the best one was face-to-face. And uh, so I have used remotes. I uh, was my snow leopard work was uh, famous for that. But I've and uh, wherever necessary, it's an incredible tool because you'll find cats that you will never ever see. And I had to figure out how to be able to get an image of these secretive cats that look normal. You know, it's just like them walking by on the trail or at their marking place. And, you know, you have to light them also. So I want to try to mimic daylight. And uh, you set this, you know, thing up. It's like lighting a movie set or a stage and just wait for the actor to walk on. Sometimes you gotta wait a long time. How long does your scent stay on the set? Do you have any idea? You know, I'm, I'm sure they know that you've been there. Yeah, you know, um, a lot of people ask me about scent. Um, being a photojournalist and not having a background in wildlife, you show me a place in the world that there aren't humans, and I'll go, well, maybe it might make a difference. But everywhere I go, there's there's people in one way or another, and I could care less whether they smell me. You know, anybody that walks through has a scent, especially if they're a Westerner, which, you know, many places I work in, they're not there. But, you know, we use toothpaste, soaps, deodorant, okay. uh, shampoo. I don't use any type of cologne, but some people do. But even a normal person walks by and, you know, these animals noses are so incredibly attuned to any change that you know, I don't worry about it. Are you always a, an animal person or, or a cat person in particular? Do you have an affinity for any of these? I'm a cat guy, but it happened by accident. But boy, am I lucky because it's good to specialize in this day and age. Oh, yeah. You know, and it's all happened by accident. Uh you know, I had no, I have no background in biology. I barely passed it in high school, but uh, and I kind of fell into my first natural history story and got visited by a jaguar on the first story. Mm-hmm. At night, scared me to death. And what was the story on? Uh, it was on a bird. Didn't know anything about birds either. It was on the resplendent cats all. I kind of talk about that in my talk coming up. You know, it's like uh, um, it happened. I uh, met a scientist that was working on them, and I proposed it because it had never been done before. And I found that doing stories that had never been done before was really good financially because you never got a no. Mm. You know, if they felt, you know, once you got to the point where it's like, oh, Steve can do it, then, you know, I fell into it. Even stories I didn't know hadn't been done before, like cougars. I didn't know that it had never been done before. I mean, it's America's cat. How could nobody have ever done a wild cougar story before? But, you know, it was the first, and it was only a couple of years ago. How'd you get 
and maybe backing up a bit, how'd you get to that point where you were already getting those assignments? Because did you come out of straight photojournalism? Yeah, I was a photographer at Black Star, and uh, I got a job through Black Star uh, for Merck Pharmaceuticals, a PR shoot. Mm-hmm. And I was like, dude, a corporate job, that's cool. And it was trying to find new drugs in the rainforest. So. Oh, okay. Uh, I'd never been in the jungle before. I went down with my family. My wife had seven shoots for Science Magazine. She was a photographer at the time, uh, and she's been a writer for the last 15 years. Um, And we went down to Costa Rica, met a bunch of really interesting and passionate scientists. Instead of the stuff I was doing in the New York area for Newsweek, Business Week, Fortune Time, I mean, it was kind of the same old thing, and all of a sudden, this was exciting. Mm-hmm. I was in a place that scared me. Fear is great. Um, and just being around people that were passionate. Uh, and did 180 degree on my career. How do you blend the photojournalism into the wildlife work? Well, you know, the best thing about it was I didn't know a damn thing about wildlife photography. I didn't own a nature book. I didn't look at it. I wanted to be a National Geographic photographer since I was eight years old, but it had nothing, absolutely nothing to do with animals. It was a disconnect. It's not that I didn't like them. I love them, you know, but I just it never entered my mind. Uh, you know, I was looking at photojournalists when I was young, and that's what I aspired to be. Do you do you approach animals differently than you approach people? So I feel no language barrier. I mean, seriously. Yeah. Oh no, no, no. <laughs> I mean, it's it's tough in the way that you know animals don't invite you to dinner, so it's kind of lonely. <laughs> you know, you're out there all alone in many instances. You know, but. It was great that I didn't know anything about him because I immediately gravitated toward the fact that you had to tell the story. Mm. That um, And, you know, having my first big cat story being something that you couldn't even see, it was great because I immediately found that there was an underlying story there that I didn't know about um, at the time or I didn't know how serious it was. I was working on jaguars and get done in Brazil and... You know, working on a ranch and find that all these cowboys carry guns and if they see a jaguar, they're going to kill it because they were of the opinion that every dead cow was the fault of a jaguar. I knew that was not true, um, even though I was a layman at the whole thing. And so I I started working with Wildlife Conservation Society at the Bronx Zoo, um, got them interested in a project and told them how great the person I was working with, they hired her and did the first ever GPS sat collared study of cats so I could go to the former mayor of Rio who was complaining about losing a few cows, man that owned Kimberly Clark Brazil. Um, I think he can lose a few cows. <laughs> um, that, But we got scientific data that it was uh, like one and a half percent of dead cows could be attributed to jaguars. And that started my uh, work with scientists. Um, now, throughout my career, I've worked with scientists to try to, you know, bring about change. I always say the story starts on the pages of National Geographic, but you got to take it further, even though financially I have to go to my next story because none of us are anything but contract or contributing photographers. <laughs> But I keep going at it so I can see something positive come out of what I did, maybe save the animal. These series that, that you, you shoot, who's uh, who's on the ground helping you? Who's finding the locations to get the cameras set up? Who do you work with other than the scientists? And and can you talk a little bit about that process? Oh, 100%. Um, I work with scientists. And if it is a story that has that's primarily camera trapping, I've only done two of those, snow leopards and cougars, even though I did see some cougars too. Um, but you have to have scientists. On snow leopards, I, if I didn't have Dr. Rodney Jackson from Snow Leopard Conservancy, he'd already found locations. But it was, in the end, it's local people that are always there. The scientist has to go either. They have either a job at a university or they can't spend that much time in the field. So I end up working with local people and they know everything because guess what? A scientist hires local people too. So in the end, it was uh, partly my training um, as a photojournalist that I gravitated towards 
working with local people, and they have been infinitely more valuable in many instances than scientists. P-22 is different. Uh, I was a scientist. Uh And do you... Is there a producer on these shoots? Is there the editor back in no, the magazine? No, I do everything. Do? They're my ideas. I find the um, places I can go, get the permits. I mean, some of these, like Tigers, took two years to get permits to work in the places I wanted to work. So it's a long process. I, uh, I do television at the same time now. So, I mean, even getting carnets and everything, when we just did, we're doing Jaguars, we just came back. Are you monitoring all this stuff live? As it's happening, when you when you have cameras out there, are you anywhere? No, no. So you I'm, don't know what you have until way after no, the fact. No, uh, I mean not way after the fact with digital now. Um, I only did, you know, I did Jaguars, and then I didn't touch a camera trap for nine years. Ah. Everybody thinks I'm the king of camera traps because I figured out how to use them for myself, um, because I had to. Because I had to do, I said I was going to do snow leopards, and so I had to do it. Right. <laughs> but you know, I can go check them and then see what I got, and then I'll adjust things uh, as as far as the behavior of the animal goes, or lighting, or things like that. And I'll leave camera traps in the field. Right now, I have six cameras in Brazil. Right now. And how um, many other animals are you capturing as well? I imagine you're lot. photographing a lot of stuff. Anything yeah. that goes by there, right? Anything that goes by, but the camera is set for an eye-to-eye view with this cat. Okay. Like I have a camera in a tree right now. I have a still camera and a, a 4K video camera right next to it on the other side of this tree looking at a branch uh, in a tree. And these jaguars come up the tree. And I may get other animals that happen to break the beam, okay. but right. the pictures aren't any good. Um, if the scientist wants to know what kind of animal comes up the tree, fine, you know. But I have never, ever used one of these other images except a deer because it's big, you know. And somebody wanted a picture of a deer, so I did it. And is it a burst? Uh, do you, is there a general burst rate that you No, should because be? the... Um, I have to base this on, if it's a rare animal like a snow leopard, I had to expose it for noon or, of course, midnight. Who cares, you know? But it has to be good at noon because I start getting pictures. Though people always say, you're never going to get a picture of this animal during the day. First pictures during the day. I always say if a human tells me what an animal is going to do, it's going to do the exact opposite. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, let maybe jump into this question. What what is a? How do you draw the line in terms of um, the interaction prior to a shot? Do you is there any? Is it okay to draw a reaction or to? Is there any way that you'll you'll ever do that? Nah, and not even you know, not with like animals of prey or anything, but even, I don't know, what, what, any animal. Well, I don't bait. I don't bother. Yeah. Uh, one of the beauties of learning camera trapping is that that first frame is mine. I use stand-ins for the cat, whether it's coming from the left or the right. I want that to be my composition. You know, if the cat goes this way or that way, I, a lot of times I want it to go this way, and then if it went the other way, the picture sucks, so I wait for it to go the way that I compose the image for. Um, we don't bait. We don't put scent down or anything like that. Why? You know, go shoot in a zoo if that's what you want to do, the way I look at it. That Because I'm given enough time, and I get grants from the geographic also, or I couldn't do any of the stories that I do because it just takes so long. And now with TV, um, grants are really important. You come across guys out there that are doing it? In a, a I don't really don't like see it. other people. And until Nampa gave me an award last year, I don't even know. If they don't work in geographic, I don't know. You know, seriously, I, I don't. When I'm home, I get to be home. The hardest part of the job is being away from your family. I don't hang around wildlife photography things. I don't at all. 
<laughs> In fact, I don't know most photographers. What people. percentage of your year is away working? It really all depends. This year, my wife is a scholar at the Woodrow Wilson Institute in Washington. And she says, I've been a photo widow. She moved there March 7th from Hoboken. I've been there maybe 12 days or 14 days since March. So, And how long have you been doing this for? So I've been at Geographic for 25 years. Okay. Yeah. And it's yeah. still fun flying, isn't it? <laughs> it's still, you know, we just took 40 bags to Brazil. That's the part that's not fun, you know, but we got How them How many of those did you get as carry-on? I'm really curious. God. <laughs> I can only carry two, but, you know, on the way back, I had to bring a 32 terabyte G-Force and was in its own case. And so I don't remember what I did with my case. Oh, I put it in a suitcase, carried my cameras, uh, but I just came back for a short period of time. But it's a real pain in the ass, and, and, you know, part of it is it's tough. I was one of the first guys, the first guy that I know to buy a sat phone. You know, it's nice being married if you want to be, and I do. So I, if I'm on the <laughs> other side of the world, I call them twice a day. I was in this hemisphere, so I would, you know, not want to do that because I get up at 5 a.m., you know, so I don't wake my wife up. I just call her at night, but... uh um, yeah, it's the toughest part of the job and travel sucks, you know, I mean, you get a carne for Brazil and they get down there and they go, we don't accept carnets unless it's shipped via cargo. Well, that's BS. So you, luckily I have an eight hour layover cause I spend all that time in customs and then trying to convince the next airline that we already paid their excess. And in the end they found out we did. And then we had like an hour and a half to make the airplane go to another terminal What's your general gear setup? What do you use? What what systems? What what's your your lenses and? Well, I'm all. Uh, I, I use the, the top major brands. I shoot Canon and Nikon. Okay. I have twelve Nikon cameras and a bunch of lenses. So it and sounds like you're all DSLR still. Yeah. <laughs> have you used mirrorless at all? Are you incorporating any of the smaller yeah, that's light of the, cameras? Yeah, that's what's up in the tree. So I lied. Now I shoot Sony also. Uh. There's an A7S II up in that tree filming the Jaguars. Uh, okay. The two cubs and their mom in the tree. It's Perfect the, camera. Yeah, the stuff's Film incredible. Video. That's yeah. shooting video. Okay. No, I asked him about probably seven years ago now. If they could make me a HD video trap, and it took them about four and a half years, they hired a young kid out of University of South Dakota, 23 years old. He wrote the circuitry for it, hmm. and they said, "Oh, we got your camera." I said, "What?" They said, "Yeah, that camera you asked for." I said, "That was over four years ago." <laughs> 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 but you know, it, it's incredible now. And I just met some guys at this fundraiser last week that. Uh, you're going to help us with triggers, a company out of Michigan. So we're and redoing everything. After that first that first shot and that flash of light, the, those animals, they bolt? Does that light make them? You school? know, scientists use yeah. all these trail cams all the time. And for some reason, these animals don't react. Oh, yeah? Um, a P-22 stopped dead in his tracks for 10 pictures till he raised his head so much that the collar that we that I bought through a Granite National Geographic was almost not visible. So I was very happy about that. From then on, walk through, never stop. You know, they don't really pay attention to them. I have no idea why, especially a cat that has great night vision. You know, you would think that that would ruin their night vision, but it's like lightning, I guess. Because it's something yeah. I've thought about because scientists use this all the time. Now, some only use infrared. And others want to see a little bit more. Mm -hmm. you know? yeah. uh, let's talk a bit more about this because P twenty two is the is the name for the for, yeah, the, for the cat for the cat yeah. that's out in the Santa right. Monica Hills outside yeah. of L A. And you did a long series on well, trying to get a photo of yeah. a, a cougar in front of the Hollywood sign, something like that. Well, I started trying to get a cougar in front of Golden Gate Bridge. Oh yeah, I had cameras there for eighteen months. <laughs> uh, how and often do you check them? How often are you going to go back and take a look at that? I don't. I have other people do okay. it, you know. But I went to a mountain lion meeting in Bozeman, Montana, because I'd heard that there's a cat that goes through Cher's backyard. It's got a <laughs> collar on it. Sure enough, it does. And I said, do you have a trail where you, you can see the lights of LA in the background? 
And the guy goes, well, it goes there, but they're, they're smart. And then they come back. Not all of them were. One of them got shot by the Santa Monica police. But, um, and then I just off the top of my head said, wouldn't it really tell the story to get a mountain lion with the Hollywood sign? It's something that I visualized just because being on top of the Marin Hills, looking out to San Francisco and Golden Gate Bridge was difficult. It was a pain. It didn't work. And I needed that picture. And for some reason, that popped into my head. And the scientist looked at me like I was crazy and said, well, that would be a great idea, but there's no mountain lions in Griffith Park where the Hollywood sign is. It's eight square miles, you know, right in Hollywood. Um, and I said, well, keep me in mind. Eight months later, I'm in the dentist chair across from the Empire State Building. And my phone vibrates, and it's it's from the scientist. He says, call me now. Hmm. And uh, I called in, and he goes, guess what? We have trail cams crossing the Hollywood Bowl in Griffith Park, and we just got a picture of Mount Lion. And, you know, it's sometimes it pays to... Think big and be a little crazy. Uh, it took 15 months to get the picture because it's a four-second exposure. I need to find a place where it was totally dark in the foreground because flashes go off, cat keeps walking, but the Hollywood sign is not lit. That's right. Yeah, so yeah. the I looked at it, and the pictures just really sucked of, like, coyotes in front of it and all this, and it was like the exposure is four seconds. I can't push the ISO anymore, you know, or I'd put an, I have to put another camera in there. And I already lost three cameras here in the park. Uh, ended two, up, lost them yeah, two. I was just going to say two. two I didn't lose two. shit. They stole them. They stole okay. Them. <laughs> we just wanted to clarify yeah, that. Yeah, okay. right. um, they were in steel boxes, chained up, uh, the 100 to $150 worth of chain, depending on how far away the closest tree was. They were staked into the ground with um, the same uh, cable that they use for snares on tigers. So nobody can pull it out of the ground, but somehow they took it apart. But, you know, I got the picture because we found a trail that was going to work, you know. And even with that four seconds, that's why it took so long. You know, that other place I could do it. I got him in front of L.A. first and the Geographic let the LA Times put it on the front page of the paper, and that changed everything. Was this a known cat or just a noon that popped up from somewhere? Yeah, he's a dispersing male. See, they don't have anywhere to go Pacific Ocean, Oxnard, LA, or across the 101. Uh -huh. If they can cross the 101, they can go all the way to San Jose. It's a long way, but you got mountains all the way, and you got no problem. So that's why this conversation started. People got interested in the fact that there was a secretive cat there that's only been seen by five people in five years. It went under a crawl space and somebody came to put a security system in. So then he was all over the news because they stuck a TV camera in there. But the guy opened the crawl space, stuck his flashlight in there, and there was P-22 underneath oh, there. Man. Scared the guy to death. <laughs> so everybody shows up all night long. They're filming him and they're just sticking a camera in there with a light. And then they all went home, 3 a.m. He left around then. Um, and then everybody came back in the morning, and the scientist goes, he's gone. I don't even know if the scientist stuck around and even tell him that. Because <laughs> <laughs> I don't think Jeff would have. It would have been like, yeah, figure it out on your own. So just <laughs> what was your reaction when you finally, after all that time, you, you saw you got the shot? I got the shot, uh, and I thought it sucked. <laughs> Um, so I told my editor I was going to go back and relight it because in the beginning we were getting a bunch of flack from the private security company. Yeah. You know, they're in the Hollywood Hills. You know, who are you guys? And it was my assistant's. You know, he didn't tell them who we were. You know, we have permission from the city of L.A. and the film department and on and on. We're from National Geographic. So I put one light on it, and it was the hardest thing I ever did. These traps took forever. Um, you had to be sure they didn't get stolen, and some of them took four or five days or a week to put up, and that was the last day. I put one light on, and I thought, Spotlight Hollywood. <laughs> it looked like crap, and you uh -huh. can see the collar, so I uh -huh. lit it at 90 degrees or 45 degrees. And so it kind of hid the collar but gave 
you know, some shadowing on the shoulder. About how many shots like with the with the cat in the frame did you have before you got the one that? Uh, I mean, over all this time. So on. One. Well, I got him with L.A. in the background. I got 10 because he stayed the whole time. Mm -hmm. It's set for take 10 pictures every second and a half. That's how fast the flashes will recycle. Um, And you want to be sure that the capacitors are up all the way. And sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. So I got those 10 pictures in another location. But in this one, I only got one shot. Mm -hmm. You know, in the cat in eight square miles doesn't act like a normal cat. It was maddening. Yeah. Because if you're in the wild, you know that they have a home range and they'll pass the same area every 10 to 14 days. Okay. So you know you're going to get it, but not in Griffith Park. Can you uh, tell us about the results of some of this photography? What is it brought now? Well, you know, from the beginning, you know, I don't know why I felt like this, but even from the beginning story I did on Jaguars, I felt like, you know, you can't just hear that there's problems if you have a possibility to help. I always say the story starts on the pages of National Geographic, and I want to take it further, you know, to try to make a difference Um, in a small way with a scientific project or in a huge way with a $65 million wildlife overpass, the largest in the world. And so there's a certain amount of pride that, you know, and thanks to P-22 for walking by the camera, but that the city of the people of the of L.A. and the surrounding community um, got excited enough about the fact that they found that they had mountain lions on the largest urban park in the United States. And the other thing is in two months um, year before last, five cats were killed in two months being hit by cars. Two oh, of, yeah. Three of them were cubs. Uh. So, I mean, people don't like seeing that on the news and in the newspaper. And, you know, nobody even knew it was the largest urban park in the United States for everybody. Malibu's here. East of that's the 101, and it's a bunch of places where we go hiking. The fact that there's mountain lions, they didn't even know it because you don't see them. Yeah, so that really garnered a lot of support and something positive. Have you entertained using drones or are you using drones at all? We use drones all the time. Oh. I don't can't remember the last time I paid for a helicopter. Oh, yeah, I can. It was June in Columbia, but that's because it was the only way to get into where we were going. But and, and what are you I, using them for? for? For planning shots or for actually trying to get? No, just because I do TV at the same time. Okay. Uh, uh, so we use drones for um, for shooting the video. We've used them. Um, we were in this place. Uh, I think it's one of the wildest places left on earth, Colombia, where there's been a 50 year civil war, and we used them to look for these 20,000 year old jaguar petroglyphs. Um, but it was just we were only there four days, and you know we went down. Said, yeah, there's paintings there. We can't get the drone closed because there's trees in the way. But we've used them for... But they, I imagine the drones enable it to get you a lot further than you'd be able to get otherwise. Well, not only that, we just did two and a half months on the water in the Pantanal, and we got incredible stuff. Or my cameraman, Bertie Gregory, who's going to be a very famous guy in the future. He's an incredible 23-year-old kid. I hired him um, out of school. I mean, he was still in University of Bristol. So, um, or Bristol U, they call it in England. I'm not sure, but yeah, we love drones, and it saves a lot of money. You know, yeah. the, you know, it's just absolutely incredible. Steve Winter, thank you very much. Oh, you're welcome. Thanks for having me. Thanks, man. Really appreciate it. That was great. Thank you to Steve Winter for joining us, and thank you to Alyssa Adams and the Eddie Adams Workshop. A special shout out to Nikon, a key sponsor of the Eddie Adams Workshop, and a thank you to B and H and a whole bunch of other companies that add additional support to make the workshop possible. Thank you to Jason, thank you to John, thank you to our listeners, and if you have a moment, give us a review on iTunes. And as always, thank you so much for joining us today.